Okay, so Paula Cushing is the Senior Curator of Invertebrate Zoology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. She's been there since 1998. She's one of the longest holding, uh, longest curators holding that position in a long time. So we're very lucky to have her. She got her PhD at, in Florida at, at the University of Florida. Her general focus has been uh, Rocky Mountain and Great Plains spiders uh, and the Colorado Spider Survey. Uh, she's published papers on spiders and ants and the different kinds of relationships they have. So they can have a mimicry where the spider mimics the ant. They can have predatory relationships where the spider preys on the ant, and they can have associative uh, relationships where the spiders hang out where the ants are. Um, she's the co-editor of the Spiders of North America, and she's the past president and director of the American Arachnological Society. And now I have to tell you a story that I love about Paula. So while she was president at the Denver Museum, she hosted the annual meeting of the North American Society of Arachnologists. And they had their banquet at the museum, which is a really special place to do that. And you know how on each table at a banquet, there'll be uh, maybe a bouquet of flowers or some kind of centerpiece. Well, what Paula did was she captured black widow spiders and put them all in glass jars. And that was the centerpiece on each table. And everybody fought over them. They couldn't wait to get to be the winner and take one home. So my, my talk today is called Spider, uh, Spiders in Fact and Fancy or something like that. So what I want to do in this lecture is give you an overview about why we should all be fans of spiders, why they're special, why they're important, why they're more important for you guys than just bird food. Because I know that's what you're thinking. I know it. So what are spiders? And this is not working. Is there a way to turn it on? Oh, it did. Spiders are the lions and tigers of the world of creepy crawlies. They are eating a lot of insects every single year. Spiders are found in every terrestrial environment on Earth except Antarctica. And a few years ago, a colleague, some colleagues, uh, produce a paper where they wanted to estimate how important are spiders in eating insect populations. Just taking my... <laughs> and what they estimated is that the worldwide population of spiders is eating 400 to 800 million tons. Don't, don't change it. Million tons of prey in the form of insects. And in the same paper, if you want to just forward it, uh, they estimated that the worldwide population of humans is eating only 200 million tons of, pre of, of protein. And so, of course, this is the kind of, of uh, title that, came, that the press picked up, is somehow they conflated this information and decided that spiders could eat the human population. Well, of course, that's not true. But spiders are eating twice the amount of protein in the form of insects than humans are eating, which is a little mind boggling. So they're incredibly important as insect predators. And it is still not working. So if you could, yep. So scientists being very orderly human beings, they like to order life on Earth into different categories called taxonomic categories. From most inclusive to least inclusive, these categories are kingdom, phylum, class order, family, genus, and species. So spiders are in the kingdom Animalia. They're animals like we are. Um, there we go. <laughs> They're animals like we are. They're in a phylum called the phylum arthropoda. And that phylum, arthropods, include any animals that have an exoskeleton and jointed legs. So arthropods include not just the arachnids, but they include insects, millipedes, centipedes, crustaceans, any, any animals that have an exoskeleton and jointed legs. Within the phylum arthropoda, the animals that I study are in the class arachnida. So there's lots of different classes within the phylum arthropoda. Class arachnida is anything with eight legs, generally with two body parts, 
Within that class arachnida, there are 12 different orders. So daddy long legs are their own order. Scorpions are their own order. Spiders are in the order Arrhenii. Uh, there are pseudoscorpions, et cetera. Within just the order Arrhenii, which are the spiders, there are, as of this week, 132 families, over 4,280 genera, and over 50,000 described species. And I say as of this week because there are more species being described every single year in every terrestrial habitat where spiders are found. In fact, uh, just in 2019, some colleagues and I described a new family of spiders, the Marmiciculturidae. And that is a, a family that includes just one species. This was a species that was collected in the Chihuahuan Desert. None of us could identify it. We didn't know where it should be placed, where its taxonomic placement was. We couldn't identify the species. And so my colleague, Martin Ramirez, he used the DNA analysis and determined that this was totally different, so different from any other known species that it should be included in its very own family. This spider, and it was only collected in the vicinity of ant nests, if you can forward. And these are the spiders. They've only been collected in the vicinity of ant nests in the Chihuahuan Desert. So we hypothesized that Maybe they were living inside the nest. Maybe they were living in the vicinity of ant nests. But what were they doing? So in during the pandemic, I traveled down and worked with one of the co-authors, one of the people who originally found this spider, Norman Horner. And we went down to Texas, to the Big Bend region of Texas, and deep in the Chihuahuan Desert. And we were managed to collect two adult females of this spider. And we ran some experiments in the laboratory at, uh, at the Dalquest Desert Research Station. And we discovered, this just came out two weeks ago, a paper came out two weeks ago where we discovered that this is a specialist ant hunter. So most arthropod predators, how many of you, let me, let me ask this, how many of you will, will voluntarily walk across an active ant nest? None of us would do that, right? because they sting and they bite and they attack in mass. So ants are not a real popular prey for arthropod predators. It's very unusual for, for you to find an arthropod predator that will specialize on hunting ants. But that's exactly what this spider does, is it's an ant specialist. It's what we call a marmicophage. And it is it will sneak up to ants behind them. So it, it comes out of their little retreats, it rushes up to a live ant, it bites it in the rear leg, backs off, waits for the ant to succumb to the venom, reapproaches, grabs the ant behind the head, carries it off to feed on the ant. And if a live ant were to approach the spider that has a dead ant in its chelicerae in its jaws, the spider will twist its body around so it presents the dead ant to the live ant like a shield. Very unusual hunting behavior. So just two weeks ago, I traveled back down to the Chihuahuan Desert to figure out whether this spider is living in the vicinity of the ant nests or actually living in the ant nest, because wouldn't that be strange if it was living in the nest with the animals it was preying upon? And we got some photographic evidence that suggests that's exactly what it's doing. And then the paper that, uh, that just came out, we did find some evidence that this spider is a chemical mimic of ants. So it does have some uh, chemistry in its body, some chemical signals that are very similar to the ant signals that the ants use to identify colony mates from non-colony mates. So it's a really interesting and very weird system. So I'm sorry. That's a great question. The question was if they live or are associated with a specific species of ant. We think that they're associated with a genus of ant, Aphenogaster. Uh, what we found is they're more commonly found with Aphenogaster alba, uh, albacitosis, one species. But there's some evidence that they also are associated with Pagonomyrmex ants, a completely different species. So that's an excellent question. We don't know what's going on there, whether they are absorbing colony odors of whatever ant they're, they're living near. 
So let's talk about numbers. I said there were over 50,000 described species of spiders on Earth, but there are fewer than 600 professional arachnologists to study these animals. And if you include all the species of arachnids, scorpions, daddy long legs, mites and ticks, there's well over 100,000 species. Let's compare that number to some of the popular vertebrate groups, particularly for this group of people, birds. About 10,000 or so species of birds, about 5,400 species of mammals worldwide. And yet, how many birders are there? How many mammologists are there? Too many to count. You guys are taking over the world of biology. We need more arachnologists. We, we need people to ignore these minor groups of vertebrates, like the birds and the mammals. So we that's one reason I love doing programs like this. I love to get people excited about this group, this taxonomic group that is so important in the world. Uh, years ago in the early 1900s, an arachnologist by the name of William S. Bristow estimated that a one acre field, could you go to the next? Uh, could house over 250,000 individual spiders. And if you've ever seen sites like this, where late in the summer, early in the fall, the baby spiders are doing something called ballooning, flying off in the air on little silken threads, and those silken threads are, being, are covering uh, fields with their, with their silk lines early in the morning when the dew is covering those fields. It's not hard to imagine that that number might be pretty close to accurate. Now, I know this is a shocker for you, but I am uh, one of the few professional arachnologists in the Western states. In fact, the next closest professional arachnologist besides my students who are in training is a, a former student of mine who works up in Montana. And then I've got some colleagues in Kansas, some colleagues in, in California. So you can imagine that I get a lot of spider questions every year. I get on average about one question a day, th over 300 questions. And uh, I know, again, it's a shocker, but the most common reaction I get from people when I tell them what I study is this. But really, that's, that is a, 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 a crazy response. Spiders are the good guys, not the bad guys. Uh, as I've just covered, they're eating lots of insects. They're really important in controlling insect populations. I think one reason spiders kind of freak people out is because they're so foreign from us. We're diurnal, we're active in the daytime. Uh, spiders are mostly nocturnal, active in the evening, at dusk, in the nighttime. And they just, they act differently than us. They scurry around, they run fast. And of course, we all know they're predators. We all know that they're the majority of spiders, all but essentially one, one species are venomous. So when I get a call at the museum, and they say, I found a spider in my house. Is it poisonous? What they really mean is, is it venomous? And the answer to that is yes. Essentially, all spiders have venom, but the venom evolved to take down insects, not to take us. We're, we, are, we are of no interest to spiders. They can't eat us. So spiders are really, for the vast majority of those over 50,000, completely harmless to humans. Next slide. So it is estimated that maybe 100 species have venom of, of medical importance to humans. Because again, the venom did not evolve to take down humans to affect vertebrates. It evolved to kill insects. So it's a great insecticide, but it's not uh, usually of any concern to us. So why is that? Next slide. One, because we're big, they're little. So the amount of venom is insignificant for a large mammal like us. The jaws, the jaws of spiders are called chelicerae. For most spe species, for a lot of species, the jaws are simply not strong enough to pierce our thick, tough skin. Uh, spiders are usually far too timid, and even if they do encounter us or we encounter them, uh, they're not going to waste their venom. Venom is metabolically expensive to make, so why waste your venom on something you can't eat? Uh, contact with humans is unlikely. And for most species, the amount of venom or the, the venom itself has no components, no, no compounds in it that our body responds to negatively. It might hurt for a few minutes, but that's about it. Uh, next slide. The one species that we have, uh, one more, that does have venom medical importance to humans in, in the Western states 
is the Western black widow, Latrodectus hesperus. We have one species of black widow that's found here. Uh, and it has what is called, it has a component in its venom called latrodectin. So if you have the bad luck to get bitten by a black widow, and it is really hard to get bitten by a black widow, they are timid, they're not likely to waste their venom on you. Bites occur when somebody accidentally encounters a, a black widow that's hiding, hiding under a rock, under a log. You don't know it's there. Behind furniture, you're moving that object, and you accidentally press down on the spider. When you press down on it, you're threatening it, it can't escape, and that's when bites can occur. And even then, and I have been bitten, and I'll tell you that story in a second, but uh, even then it could be a dry bite. It could be a, uh, asymptomatic because they're not wasting their venom. They're just trying to get away. But the latrodectin, one more slide. And, oh, sorry, sorry, can you go back? Let me show you, this is a male, this is an adult male. So I get a lot of questions about juvenile black widows and adult males that look quite different than the black shiny female. And the, in the juvenile and adult male stage, they have very different color patterns on the dorsum, on the back of the abdomen than the females do. They still all have the red hourglass on the underside, on the belly side, but they have very different color markings. And uh, one more back, look at these pedipalps, four legs, one, two, three, four. See these, these pedipalps look like boxing gloves. Remember that. Next slide. So what are the effects or the symptoms of black widow envenomation? If you do get envenomated by a black widow, there's not usually a whole lot of pain right at the bite site, but what the latrodectin, this component in the venom causes, is an uncontrolled release of acetylcholine and norepinephrine. These are neurotransmitters at, throughout your body. So it can cause really super painful symptoms throughout the body. Real typical symptoms are hardening of the stomach muscles. It feels like somebody has been kicking you in the gut over and over and over again. Uh, pain in your joints, pain in your lymph nodes, facial contortions, sweating, hypertension, increased heart rate. Those are really typical symptoms of envenomation. Uh, and the envenomation, uh, next slide, is, is variable depending on the kind of mammal that's bitten. So for humans, you're not going to die, but you might wish you were dead. It can be that painful. Rabbits seem to be resistant to the venom. Rats, cats, guinea pigs, mice, horses may die from envenomation. Dogs might get sick. So it's, it's interesting that it's really variable, the effects of the venom, depending on the kind of mammal that's, that's bitten. Next slide. Uh, untreated, the symptoms usually resolve within 48 hours, a couple days, but that's two days of very painful symptoms. Uh, so if you do get bitten and envenomated by a black widow, first of all, take whatever remains of the spider. Presumably you've killed it because you pressed down on it. You saw it bite, you felt it bite. Take it with you to the hospital so that they know exactly what it is that's causing the problems. Uh, there is antivenin available, but the antivenin is derived from horse serum. And there's a protein in horse serum that less than 1% of the human population is allergic to. So sometimes physicians are a little bit reluctant to administer antivenin to a healthy adult, knowing that the symptoms will resolve on their own and that there might be a risk of this anaphylactic shock. So they might just give you some pain meds, opiates or something to deal with the painful, painful symptoms. Uh, but antivenin usually resolves, should resolve it within about a half an hour. Uh, but I got bitten once, and uh, it was when I had, I had a black widow just like I have here in a jar, and it was a Halloween event for my colleagues at the museum, and I was handling the spider, which I often do to show people that you can handle a black widow, and it's not going to go for your jugular. It just perceives you as a, as a warm, slightly sweaty surface to walk upon. So I was handling it all night, and finally towards the end of the evening, I lowered my hand to let it back into its jar, and she clearly had had enough. Because as she was getting off my hand, she gave me a little nip on the tip of my finger. And I was so surprised that I said, ah, she bit me. And of course, my colleagues freaked out, asked if they should call 911. And I said, you know what? Wander back over here in a half an hour and I'll let you know. It was tender for a couple of days, but that was it. No other symptoms. So she clearly was just done. She was done being handled. She didn't want to be handled anymore. And she was just giving me a little warning bite, but essentially a dry bite 
Because again, why waste your venom on something you can't eat? I get very few questions about black widows, except for this year for some weird reason. And, and let me ask, how many of you have seen black widows in your yards? Yeah, we almost all of us have seen black widows. They're very common. I get very, usually very few questions about black widows, although this year, I don't know what happened, but they hit the news. I get lots of questions about this stupid animal. This is a, a recluse spider in the family Sicariidae. It's in one genus, Loxosceles. And uh, it's also called the fiddleback spider because of the markings on the back of the cephalothorax. The head region of a spider is called the cephalothorax. Kind of looks like a fiddle. So oftentimes I get calls from probably arachnophobes saying, I found a spider in my house and I'm pretty sure it's a recluse spider. And I say, probably not because we are not part of the natural range of any species of this genus of Loxosceles. And they say, no, 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 it has that fiddle marking. And I say, well, to any arachnophobe, they all look like they have that stupid marking. I say, well, that's not really the way to tell. The way to tell is to look at their eyes. Most spiders have eight eyes. These animals have only six eyes arranged as three dyads. Next slide. Three pairs of eyes around the, the I think, next slide. There should be arrows. Anyway, three pairs of eyes around the cephalothorax. And of course, when I say that, their response to me is, what are you kidding? I'm not going to get that close. But that is the way to tell recluse spiders from any other uh, spiders. The reason is it not forwarding. <laughs> the reason these have such a bad rep is because recluse spiders, when they envenomate you, and again, envenomation is uncommon. It's usually asymptomatic. They're called recluse spiders for a reason. They're reclusive. They're unlikely to bite even when you encounter them. And in areas of the country where they are found, uh, they can be in pretty high numbers, even inside homes. But even there, they're, they come out at night when we're asleep. They're not likely to bite unless they're trapped. Um, and we've lost the slides, but Yen's going to get that back. Uh, the reason that they are so notorious is because they have a component in their venom called sphingomyelinase D. And that sphingomyelinase D in our cells of our tissues, we have sphingomyelin. Sphingomyelinase D is an enzyme that attacks and breaks down that part of our cell walls. So it causes the cell walls right around the bite site to explode. And it can cause, in unusual cases, it can cause dermonecrotic injuries, nasty wounds that take a long time to heal. That's in extreme cases. And it don't ever look on the internet for wounds from recluse spider. Like it, the World Wide Web, despite its name, is a really terrible source of information for spiders, even though it has a web in it. There's six eyes. This is the name. Sphingomyelinase D is the name of that enzyme that's breaking up the, the uh, component of our cell walls. My colleague, uh, Greta Binford, has done a lot of research on the venoms of loxosceles. So it breaks up the, it explodes the cells around the bite site. It can cause these open wounds that take a long time to heal. There's no anti-venin. So the best you can do is just keep the wound debrided, keep it clean, keep any secondary infection from setting in, and it'll heal over time. It'll resolve itself. Uh, next slide. This is the distribution map of the different species of recluse spiders. And what you should notice is that the natural range of, of these species does not include any of the Western states. Doesn't include Colorado, Wyoming, Montana. This is not part of the natural range of any species of recluse spider. Uh, next slide. Yet, in areas of the country where these spiders are not naturally occurring, and they can get introduced once in a while, there might be a population gets established in a point location. I've had uh, documents of populations that, that show up in a warehouse in Denver, a basement in Pueblo, a place in a house in Lamar. But I guarantee that over a couple of years, that population dies out. It doesn't spread because we are the wrong climatic conditions for the establishment of any species of recluse. But a lot of other conditions, a lot of medical conditions can also cause these dermonecrotic injuries. 
So these are some of the conditions that can cause these nasty open wounds that take a long time to heal that have been misdiagnosed as spider bites. And these include most commonly MRSA, flesh-eating bacteria, methicillin-resistant staph infection. It also includes diabetic ulcers. Lymphoma can cause these open wounds. That can be one of the symptoms of lymphoma. Now, those three conditions I just mentioned, MRSA, flesh-eating bacteria, lymphoma, diabetic ulcers, those could be treated effectively, but not if they're initially diagnosed as a spider bite. So it's important that in this region of the country, the least likely cause for these open, nasty wounds are spiders. Next slide. So I talked a bit about venom. We've been talking about venom. So why are spiders, why is venom so important? Is because they use the venom to capture their prey. We're looking at a close-up of the fang. So the jaws I mentioned of spiders are called chelicery. At the tips of the jaws are these hollow fangs that lead to a venom gland inside the cephalothorax. Spiders, when they're hunting an insect, will use a combination of silk and venom. If it's something kind of big and scary that might hurt the spider, then it might rush up and wrap it in a shroud of, of silk and then bite through the silk and inject the venom. If it's something innocuous that can't hurt the spider, it may just rush up and bite it initially and may not even waste any silk to, to wrap the prey. Uh, but usually they use a combination of silk and venom. So we're looking at the chelicery, the jaws, and the tips of the jaws are tipped with these sharp fangs that are injecting the venom. Next slide. Once they've immobilized the insect prey, then they want to feed on it. They do not have chewing mouth parts. So what we're doing here is we're looking at the underside of the cephalothorax and we're looking at the opening to the mouth. So once they've immobilized the prey, they've already poked holes in that exoskeleton with the fangs. They might even rip the prey apart a little bit more, but they're creating openings into the body. And then what they'll do is they'll squeeze their stomach, which is in their cephalothorax, and they vomit out digestive enzymes. The digestive enzymes bathe the, the insect get into these holes, these openings, pre-digest, pre-liquefy the tissue, and then they reverse the process. They relax the stomach muscles and suck that pre-liquefied, pre-digested meal right into the body. They can't do it all in one swoop, so feeding in spiders is a series of vomit and suck, vomit and suck, vomit and suck, until they've completely pre-digested and sucked up all that liquefied nutrients. The hairs that you see, these, these hair-like seedy, that are surrounding the mouth opening, the function of those is to filter out any particulate material, any indigestible bits and pieces of chitin, of exoskeleton. So if you have a pet tarantula or a pet spider, once in a while you'll see it sweeping a leg or the pedipalp or something underneath its body and it's sweeping away all that indigestible bits and pieces of material and then throwing it on the ground because it can't suck that in. Uh, next slide. So when most people think about spiders, they think about the Charlotte's web spider. They think about spiders that build the beautiful orb webs, the prey capture webs. How many of you this time of year have orb webs outside on your porch? I know I do. It's a great time for you to watch the, the orb web spiders. They'll build, and why do you think they're building on your porch? They're, what do you have on your porch? You have lights. The lights are attracting insects, so it's a great place to build your orb web. You're going to catch all those insects that are attracted to your porch lights. When you see a web like this, you know that you're looking at the web built by an orb weaving spider. So the web structure itself is indicative of the kind of spider that is living there. But not all spiders make webs to capture their prey. Next slide. So one example of a non-web building spider are, is our tarantula. Tarantulas do use silk. All spiders use silk. But tarantulas will make a silk-lined underground burrow. They hang out in the burrow. They have trip lines. They have silken lines extending outside of the burrow. They're waiting in their burrow for something to walk past their burrow entrance. They can feel the vibration because the insect will trip the lines of silk and they will rush out and grab whatever it is that's walking past. So it's a non-web building active hunter. Uh, next slide. Oh, actually, go back and let me show you something cool. This little dimple that I showed some of the live audience, 
That is the internally is the attachment point for the muscles surrounding the sucking stomach. I think that's kind of cool. Next slide. This is a, a, a trapdoor tarantula that's found in Trinidad and Tobago, and it has a silk-lined underground burrow. It also makes a little door, and it uh, holds that silk-lined circular door closed with its fangs. And if something, and there's lines that you can't see that extend out of the burrow entrance, if something, say, I don't know, a camel hair brush of a female arachnologist were to mess with those lines and create a vibration, the spider will throw the door open and rush outside so fast that a particular female arachnologist screamed like a girl, threw her brush in the air, but she did manage, next slide, to catch a, a picture of the, of the homeowner. So this is the little mygalomorph, the little tarantula-like animal that's living in that trap door burrow. We don't have this, this group here in Colorado, but it's a beautiful animal. Next slide. This is another non-web building spider, very common, uh, very common group to be found in Colorado. This is the wolf spider, family Lycosidae. And wolf spiders have a very specific eye pattern. They have eight eyes, but they have four eyes in a row on the front of the cephalothorax and four very big eyes in a kind of the edges of a square on the top of the cephalothorax. The other thing about wolf spiders, they're found in riparian areas, they're found in open uh, plains and grassland areas where they have underground bur or silk line burrows. But the wolf spiders, when they're ready to reproduce and when they're ready to lay their eggs, the mama will make a little silken cup, lay her eggs in that silken cup, cover it with silk to make an a silken egg sac. And she attaches that silken egg sac to her butt end, to her spinnerets on the, on the tail end of her body. She drags that spinneret around with her, protecting it from parasitoids, from predators. And then when the babies, when the eggs hatch, she can feel the movement of the little spiderlings. She will turn around to a hole in the egg sac and all the babies will hitch a ride on her back. And that's what you see in this upper left photo is the baby is uh, hitching a ride. I've had calls at the museum where somebody said, I've had a giant spider in my house and I, I was so freaked out, I stepped on it and it exploded into hundreds of more spiders. And of course that was a wolf spider. They stepped on a mama that had all the babies on her back and the babies all dispersed when they, when they crushed her. Next slide, another kind of um, non, oh, this is the underground burrow, the silk line burrow. Of the, of the wolf spiders we have out on the plains. And here you can very clearly see the silk lines that act as trip wires, as trip lines extending out of that silk line burrow. Next slide. Uh, it's probably, for some of the wolf spiders that we have here, uh, just the body length can be almost an inch. And with the legs, probably about like that, probably an inch and a half in diameter. So the burrow itself can be about the size of a quarter for a big one, pretty large. And then the, the, you'll also see a very similar kind of burrow for the tarantulas that live in the southeastern part of the state. Next slide. Uh, fishing spiders, and, and I think go one more and it'll have the name of the animal. Fishing spiders are in the family Pisordi. Fishing spiders we also have here in Colorado. They're found in permanent, where, where you have permanent bodies of water. They monitor the water with the first pairs of legs. And they're, they're feeling for vibrations of aquatic insects or little fish that are swimming below them. And if they feel that vibration of a potential prey, they, they will uh, dive down and drag it up to the surface of the water and begin feeding on it. Next slide. Another kind of non-web building spider are jumping spiders in the family Salticity. Jumping spiders are one of the few groups that are active in the daytime and they have extraordinarily good vision. They can see in color, they can form full images. They have eight eyes that are arranged like a U around the, the cephalothorax. The front eyes are very large. If you encounter a jumping spider and you move your finger back and forth, it'll track that movement because it, it can see, it can see the movement. They hunt like a cat, so they will creep up on their prey and then jump at the prey. Um, if after the lecture, if you're interested, I can tell you about jumping spiders sent to the International Space Station. They can see nearly 360 degrees around themselves. 
They can uh, see in color. So oftentimes they're very colorful patterns on their body. The males, when they encounter a female, will dance for their lady love. So they're very cool spiders, they're very cute spiders. So not only do they have acute vision, but they're just a very acute themselves. <laughs> Next slide. This is another non-web building spider, crab spiders. Also found a, a family found in Colorado. These are sit and wait predators. And some of the crab spiders are sit and, will sit and wait for prey to come to flowers. And they will just stay there very still on the flowers. Some crab spiders can change their color to match the flower. And so they can change from yellow to white or white to yellow to match the flower that they're on. They have very spiny front legs that they will use to trap the, the pollinating insect when it does come to the flower. Very unique eye pattern. Next slide shows a crab spider that is feeding on a fly. And all you can see of the crab spider are the legs. Next slide. Uh, this is, how many of you have seen this animal in your gardens? Yep. So this is uh, called a louse hunter. It's family Desderidae. It's called a louse hunter. It's a species introduced from Europe, Desdera crocata. And it specializes, next slide, on hunting pill bugs or roly polies. Pill bugs in Europe, where these, this species is found, are called wood lice. And this animal specializes on hunting roly polies. It has very large chelicery, very large fangs, and it uses those really long fangs to pinch around the round body of a roly poly or pill bug. And this is just cool. You can actually see the heart of the spider through the chitin of the abdomen, which I think is kind of neat. Next slide. Uh, this is another a really cool spider. It's a spitting spider in the family Scytodidae. This is not found here, although once in a while we get them introduced. It is found in the northeastern part of the United States and in the tropics. And it has a very domed cephalothorax. Next slide. And the animal, this scytota, the spitting spider, is called a spitting spider because inside its cephalothorax, next slide, it has a big, not only a venom gland, but it also has silk glands in the, ceph in the head. When it sees prey walking in front of it, it sticks its tiny little chelicery, tiny little fang straight up, and it spits a zigzag of silk on the prey and glues it down onto the surface, and then it approaches the prey and begins feeding on it. So that's what you see here. And it happens at such a high rate of speed that you can, you can barely see the movement. Next slide. Even among the, or the uh, web building spiders that do use webs to capture prey, there's lots of different forms for those prey capture uh, web devices. So we have the orb web, which I already talked about, and it's specialized for hunting and for capturing aerial prey, like uh, moths and flies and what have you. Next slide. We also have in Colorado the funnel web spiders which build a platform of silk and a funnel-like retreat. The spider stays in the funnel, and when an insect blunders onto the platform, it rushes out of the funnel, grabs it, and drags it back in the funnel. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a really large family. It includes hundreds of different species called the linophiids, boland oil, or grass spiders. If you ever go out and into your yard early in the morning when dew is in your yard, Look in the divots of your yard, and you might see a little tiny silken web. That web belongs to a linophiid. Linophiids include the tiniest little spiders, so some of the tiniest spiders. The largest uh, species of linophiid is only about four millimeters, five millimeters, so less than a quarter of an inch. Most of them are about two millimeters, two or three. And they are also called bowl and doily because they make this kind of a web in the bushes where it has a bowl-like structure and a doily underneath it. They can perceive insects that fly into any, any area of that web. Next slide. A triangle weaver is found in the conifer forest in Colorado, and it's for obvious reasons called a triangle web spider. The spider itself is right here. It's holding onto a single silk line that's attached to the apex of the triangle, and it maintains tension on that triangle. When an insect flies into the triangular web, the spider will release that tension and cause the web to tangle the prey up in it. Next slide. And this is just, this is not found here, but just a very cool spider. It's called an ogre face spider for obvious reasons. This animal is found in the tropics, some subtropics. It's found in Florida. It hangs upside down in the vegetation 
and it wa and it builds a little postage stamp size web that it holds onto with its first pair of legs. When it sees an insect walking below it, it pushes the web into the insect and tangles it up, kind of the inverse of fishing. Next slide. So now, now, regardless of whether we're talking about tarantulas, web builders, non-web builders, lycosids, orb weavers, doesn't matter. One of the common characteristics that all spiders have is silk production. Spiders have silken glands, silk glands, up to six or seven different kinds of silk glands that are producing six or seven different kinds of protein-based silks. They have those silk glands in their abdomen. The silk itself, that protein-based silk, is in liquid form. When the spider releases its silk, it squeezes the liquid silk into tubes that lead to spinnerets, which are on the butt, on the tail end, the butt end of the spider. On the surface of the spinneret, spinnerets are tiny little silken spigots. As that liquid silk is squeezed up out of the spider, it is released as a droplet, and it only changes its proteinaceous structure from liquid to solid when it's put under some tension. And that can happen literally when the spider pulls the silk out of its own abdomen. It can happen when the spider releases the droplet and a, and a wind current carries it away. That's enough tension, change it from liquid to solid. It can happen when it attaches the droplet to a surface and moves away. That's enough tension to change it from liquid to solid. Spider silk, and next slide, so this shows where the silk glands are, and they use the spider silk for a whole variety of purposes. They use some of that silk that's made by some of the glands to protect the eggs in the silken egg sacs. Some of the silk is used for dragline silk. Some is used for making the prey capture devices. Some is used to, for the underground burrows. Those are, those are different glands that are involved in those different, uh, different functions. Spider silk is extraordinary. It's a, an extraordinary material. Spider silk is stronger by unit weight. Some spider silks are stronger by unit weight than steel and very, very elastic. So spider silk is kind of the holy grail of material science. Material scientists would love to figure out how to mass manufacture a material that has the identical properties as spider silk. Uh, next slide. This is a story I love to tell because it's so crazy. In Madagascar, a group of, of material scientists, or I don't even know what field they were in, but they, they were working in Madagascar, and outside their laboratory in Madagascar was a population of the golden orb spiders in the genus Nephila. That's the genus name. They're called golden orb web spiders because this color, that's what their webs look like. They're bright, bright yellow. So these crazy scientists decided to build a little contraption where they could gently uh, immobilize one of these spiders. So they went out, they grabbed the spider, they brought it in, they put it in their little contraption, and then they milked the silk, the yellow silk, out of the abdomen of the spider. And when the spider got tired, they gave it a little water, put it outside, got another spider, kept doing this, and kept milking the silk, this bright yellow silk, and spooling it until they had enough to make, next slide, this. So this cape was a, one cape ever made, made from the silk of these golden orb spiders. They used silk from 1.2 million spiders. It took them eight years to make it. One ounce of silk was silk milk from 23,000 spiders. And what I love about this cape is if you look at the, at the, at the designs that they wove into the silk, it's an homage to the spider itself. It has the spider and the habitat and the, and the flora and the fauna that are found in that area of Madagascar. This was on display in the, in the Albert Museum in, um, in England, I think in Great Britain for quite a while. I don't know where it is now. And hopefully it's still on display somewhere. Next slide. So the last part of my talk I want to talk is, uh, is of course, the sex part, because why not leave you with sex and spiders? So how do you tell males and females? For those of you who are here in person, we went over this a little bit. Spiders have eight, eight legs. They have four pairs of legs. They have these front appendages called pedipalps. With spiders, with the females, her ovaries are in her abdomen. The male testes that are producing the sperm are in his abdomen. But the male has no intermittent organ, like a penis, associated with his abdomen. 
Instead, the males do something a little weird. Next slide. So the males have and have uh, look like they're wearing boxing gloves. Their petty palps are tipped with these enlarged structures. And they use those enlarged structures to store the sperm. Next slide. So what the male will do is he produces droplets of sperm through an opening on his abdomen. Because I said the testes are in his abdomen. He produces a little silken tri triangle of silk called a sperm web or even a little line of silk. He deposits a droplet of sperm on that sperm web. And then he has these specialized tubes that are part of his pedipalps and he sucks the sperm into the pedipalps and he stores the sperm in the pedipalp. You wanna hear the best t-shirt I ever designed? So that's called charging the pedipalps. And for the meeting that, um, that Karen mentioned, I designed a t-shirt that had a picture of a giant male pedipalp and above it was the quote, is that palp charged or are you just happy to see me? And it was signed, maybe a West Eye, and maybe a really is a genus name. I was so proud of that shirt. And then, of course, I had a colleague who's a who was a taxonomist at the American Museum, and the pedipalp was of a genus called Agilinopsis, but the quote was signed by Navia, which is a kind of jumping spider. Who cares, right? Who cares? He cared. He came up, he's like, I like your shirt, but, you know, that's not the pedipalp of Navia. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I was very proud of that. So the male will charge his pedipalps, store the sperm in his pedipalps. Next slide. And then when he mates, he's here is an under looking at the underside of a male orb weaving spider. Here are these really complex looking pedipalps. The structures of the pedipalps are species specific because the male pedipalp has to lock in place on structures that are associated with the female's abdomen. So next slide will show that. So here's the same species, the male pedipalp, and the female, her structures are called her epigenum. So the male locks his pedipalp in place, kind of like a lock and a key, and then he unwinds that tube into her and inseminates her with the sperm. Next slide. So this is our male tarantula that I just introduced you to. Uh, this is one uh, that I took in the field. But here we see his enlarged pedipalps. And with tarantulas, they have hooks. Some species of tarantulas, the males have hooks on the underside of their front legs to hook onto the female's fangs so she can't nail him when he's mating with her. But when he approaches the female, he will tap on the ground and sing a, sing a, sing a song to her. And if she's interested, she'll, she'll let him approach her and then he'll wrap his petty palp around her and inseminate her. Next slide. Now for, for non-web building spiders, there's oftentimes not much difference in the size of the males and females, but for web building spiders, oftentimes there's a really extreme sexual dimorphism and it's almost always in favor of the female. So this is a picture of that same genus, Nephila. This is the adult female. That puny little thing is the adult male. So when the male web building spiders approach a female that is sitting on her web, uh, he has to be very, very careful because he's approaching this sometimes ginormous predator. So he will sing a silk song to her. He will communicate by plucking her web that he's a mate, not a meal. Is she interested? If she's interested, she will respond accordingly and he knows it's safe to approach. And then he might do some more contact courtship. And if she's still receptive, then he'll wrap his petty palp around and mate with her. If she's not receptive and she rushes at him because she perceives him as something good to eat, he'll just drop down on a drag line of silk and get away. For non-web building spiders, the male will dance for this lady love. So jumping spiders go through this really elaborate courtship dance and they wave their petty palps around. They get very excited. And if the female's interested, she'll respond and then he, he will approach her. Although let me tell you a little story. I had a, a jumping spider one time. I had a male and a female and I had the female in a Petri dish. And so I decided that I, I wanted to uh, feed them. I wanted to introduce them. But what I did with the male, I wanted to make sure he was well fed before I introduced him to the female. And so I put in, and this was a, one of our common jumping spiders. It's all black uh, in color. It's, it's a genus called Phytopus. It's also called the elegant or something. I don't remember the common name. But I put a housefly in to feed him. And apparently that little male was like, 
about the right color, about the right size, and he starts dancing for the last line. Not the not the brightest moment. <laughs> he was very excited, but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Next slide. So uh, I will leave you with some advice, which is from Dr. Thomas Muffet. So we all know Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet and was scared away by the spider. So rumor has it that she was the daughter of a real life physician in the 1600s. And Dr. Thomas Muffet, lots of physicians back then would use spiders in their remedies, including if somebody came to Dr. Muffet's office with fever, uh, then he might suggest that they swallow a spider and a bit of butter. That'll take care of the fever. If they had asthma, he might suggest that they swallow some spider silk that should take care of the asthma. Warts, rub them with spider silk. The last one probably is efficacious. We've already talked about how strong spider silk is. And it turns out that spider silk is also slightly acidic. So you're not likely to find fungal spores or bacteria growing on, on fresh spider webs. So spider silk might actually serve as a pretty good bandage. Um, next slide. And so I will leave you there. I have given you a little bit of information about spider biology, why they're important about the sex life of spiders. And I thank you very much for your attention and we'll open it to questions. Paula, thank you so much. That was wonderful. What we do now is we go back and forth between um, the Zoom and the room. So let me start here. Do we have any questions here in the room? This really is your opportunity for spider questions. Yes, ma'am. So the question how many was, I can, yeah, how many babies on a wolf spider? That's variable depending on the species. Um, and I don't know the answer, but probably anywhere from several dozen to maybe a hundred, depending on the species of wolf spider. So the, the egg sac can contain lots and lots and lots of babies. Most of them are going to die, but several will make it through. What would the song be like? Uh, it, 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 that's also species specific. So the kind of vibrational sex song that a wolf spider would tap on the ground or the kind of dance that a jumping spider would do or the kind of silk plucking that an orb web or other kind of web builder would do is species specific. So there's a lot of uh, barriers to interspecific to two different species mating. Like if, if species A and male of species A approaches female species B, he's not going to have the right vibrational cues, the right dance, or the right song. And she will probably not be receptive. So that's one of the evolutionary barriers to hybridization. Others? Thanks. Do we have a question from uh, the Zoom? Megan, do you have any questions? Yes, looking at the chat. And thank you very much for the, for the presentation. Looking at the chat. Um, there's a question about for those orb weavers that have like the little bit of extra white zigzags of denser web in their webs, is there a purpose for that? Yeah, that's a great question. So what they're talking about is a is a bright white zigzag pattern that we find in the webs of certain species. So it could be species called Argiope, uh, some species in a family Euliboridae will make a, 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 a weird kind of um, decorative zigzag line in their silk. And there's, that's kind of a hot topic in arachnology. It comes and goes, but that, that bright zigzag of silk is called stabilimentum. And there's uh, several hypotheses as to the function of stabilimentum. For a lot of species that, that incorporate that bright zigzag of silk, the, the spider will actually stay in the middle of the web right in, in between the lines of zigzag silk during the day when actively hunting arthropod predators are active, birds, wasps, et cetera. So one hypothesis is that maybe that zigzag of silk uh, disrupts the outline of the spider and makes it harder for a predator to see the spider because this bright white silk is there. Other researchers in Taiwan um, have, have demonstrated that that bright white silk reflects in the UV. And as many of us know a lot of flowers or resources have UV reflective patterns in them that lead to a resource like nectar. So his hypothesis is that maybe that bright white silk is actually attracting pollinating insects to the web. Uh, or it could be that there's a lot of different adaptive advantages to having that bright zigzag of silk. But those are 
a couple of the major hypotheses as to the function? That's a great question. Another question. In the, it, Absolutely. Is there a good resource for identifying spiders? I am so glad you asked that because the best resources are these two field guides. Uh, this one just came out. This is by my colleague, Sarah, Sarah Rose, and it's a photo field guide. And if you prefer drawings, which I know I do, uh, Rich Bradley's field guide is really spectacular. So these are the best resources that are out there. Um, Bug Guide, which some of you may be, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's an online resource, bugguide.net, that um, is a pretty good res online resource. But honestly, for spiders, I'd go for one of the hard copy field guides. Um, another one from online. Are you waiting for the online one? Yeah. Okay, another one from online from Pam Biambino. I have a lovely close up of, or I have a close up photo of a lovely hogna taken in my yard. What are the red structures behind the coursera? Of a, of a lovely what now? Hogna, H O G N. Oh, hogna. Uh, the, 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 so the, what they're talking about is on the, on the outside of the chelicery of some wolf spiders, there's, um, a bump on the on the chelicery called a boss. To my volunteers, I tell them I'm the boss, but that's a different issue. But it's a little a little bump on the chelicery, and sometimes it's bright red. I don't honestly know. I, I'm my guess is the the bright red color pattern may be some some kind of sexual signal or intra specific signal, but that would be my best best hypothesis. I'm not absolutely sure why they evolved that bright red color pattern. Uh, two, two quick questions. Do um, spiders survive our snowy winters here in Colorado? And uh, how do house spiders survive? Do they find stuff to eat inside or? Do they perish? Great. Uh, those are good questions. How, uh, do spiders survive in our in our harsh cold climates? Generally, no. So if they're a species that's building a web where the spider itself would be exposed to our freezing temperatures, the adults will usually the usually the males are they mate, they die, you know, throw away, throw away sex. I think that's why there are so many female arachnologists, but anyway. <laughs> The, the males will typically die after they've mated for most species, not all, obviously not all, because little bashful has been alive for forever. Um, they mate, the females will lay their eggs. The eggs can overwinter. They can, they're protected from the, from freezing temperatures with the silk. So the silk does protect the eggs, but the adults that are exposed out there on your porches or on trees or in bushes, the, the females are going to die when we have our her, first hard freeze. Unless it's something like a black widow, for example, or a wolf spider that's living underground where it's protected against the freezes. So the species that have a hiding place or a burrow or someplace where they can protect themselves from, from the freezing temperatures, they can overwinter and they might live for a couple, three seasons, or like the tarantulas can live for 20, 30 years. Um, the house spiders are a different matter. And there's a lot of different, what we call synanthropic species that are really well adapted to human habitations all over the world. They might, if you throw them out of your house and put them out in the yard, if they're not native, which a lot of the synanthropic, the human adapted, human habitation adapted species are not native, um, they, they won't be able to compete very well and they'll probably die. But in your house, they're eating gnats, flies, mosquitoes. They're great to have. People think I am a terrible housekeeper because I've got spider webs all over the place. But they're, I don't have to worry about mosquitoes or flies getting into my house because the spiders are doing their job. So that's what they're eating inside the home. 
the, now, in terms of in, being inside the home, uh, you may have noticed that where you see spiders uh, very frequently is bathrooms, kitchen sinks, bathtubs. They're not crawling up through the drains. That's a myth. But what they are doing is spiders can go a long time without food. They can't go very long without a source of moisture. And so they're seeking out that source of moisture. And that's why they're ending up in your kitchens, your basements, your crawl spaces, your bathtubs, is they're seeking a drink. If you find one in your bathtub and its legs are kind of drawn up uh, and it's still alive, give a little droplet on the underside of the cephalothorax. You'll see it sucking that moisture up and then it could stretch its legs out because it turns out spiders have, they have flexor muscles in their legs, but they don't, the only way for them to extend their legs and move is by increasing blood pressure. And if they're desiccated, that's why their legs draw up. Cool little factoid. So this is very much a follow-up to that question. Someone asked, Catherine Young asked, is there any benefit to a spider um, that is indoors in releasing it outdoors? Uh, yeah, yes and no. It depends on the time of year. So it, what, what I typically recommend is if you have black widows inside your house, if you have them in your garage and outside, just leave them alone. We all have them in, in our garages and outside. If you find something like a black widow, even I will get rid of the black widow that's inside my house. But for other spiders, if it's in the spring, if it's in the warm weather, there, there's no harm in just in, in nudging them outside and letting them loose. But if it's in the dead of winter, then you're going to be killing the spider if you let it loose outside because um, it probably will freeze. But it's a, it's still, I don't, I don't, it's not like I, I don't recommend doing that. If, you, if you're kind of freaked out by having a large spider in your house, go ahead and wish it well and put it outside and hope for the best. We have another question from online if there aren't any in the room. Um, so I'm very interested in this one as well from Hazel. I was wondering if the sparse but long fossil records of spiders from the Carboniferous or even earlier as I understand it, have identified any sizes different from those today, perhaps larger than those today? Uh, that's a good question. Uh... The ancient spider, that, so it used to be thought that a, a fossil called Megarachne was a, a really giant spider that grew upwards of four or five feet. But probably about 15 years ago now, one of my colleagues, Paul Selden, re-examined that, that specimen that we thought was this giant spider, giant fossil spider, and realized it was a eurypterid, which is a very common group of chelicerates. It's a very loosely related to arachnids that was common in the ancient seas that did grow up to sometimes nine feet in length and looked very much like scorpions. So I would say that we are not aware of any uh, fossil uh, specimens in the fossil record of, of true spiders that are any larger than what we would see today. We certainly do have a few uh, tarantula sized uh, fossil specimens, but they wouldn't be any larger than the fossil than the, the currently extant uh, tarantulas. Having said that though, uh, spiders are relatively soft bodied, so they're not they're not fossilizing very well. I don't know where to look. I'm looking on the screen, but I should just look in the camera. So they're not fossilizing very well. So we really don't have, for example, as an extensive a fossil record of spiders or soft bodied, arachnids as we do of hard-bodied arachnids like scorpions or hard-bodied uh, insects or other arthropods. So it's still kind of an open question, what were the, uh, the original sort of paleo groups of, of arachnids? But brief answer, no. The, what we know of, they're, they're not bigger than what we have today. And one final question, uh, those of us on the Zoom meeting, we kind of missed that first book that you showed. Um, we got the one, we got Bug Guide and Common Spiders in North America by Richard Bradley, but not yep. the other. The other one is Spiders of North America by Sarah Rose. And uh, I have these two books available for sale. Oh, sorry, yes, here. Sarah Rose's book, and this is the photo guide that just came out, published by Princeton Press. 
So if you are interested in these resources, I have them for sale for cheaper than they retail for. So just send me an email. Uh, my email is paula.cushing at dmns.org. paula.cushing, C-U-S-H-I-N-G at denvermuseumnaturescience.org. Other questions online? Let me look really fast. There's a, several thank yous from folks online. Um, oh, there was one earlier, the follow up about what species your tarantula is, bashful is. They were asking if you, 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 weren't, you said you weren't sure, but does it have a common name for either of those species that it might be? Oh, for the tarantula? Yep. Uh, the. <laughs> So what we decided at the La Junta Tarantula Fest is that the, the common name for a fauna palmahensi, which is a species that's found in the southeastern part of the state, state what it was called the Oklahoma brown, but I think there was a consensus that we are now going to call it the Colorado brown. I think that's reasonable. In terms of a fauna palma marksi, which is a species I think it is, I do not know what the common name is. Big hairy tarantula. <laughs> it looks as though that might be all of our questions. Um, Megan, are there any more? Sorry, it took me too long to get back. Um, what are all of the spiders that we have in Colorado? And thank you so much, by the way. This was very entertaining and informative. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we have we have documented over 600 different species of spiders in Colorado. So we have a real diverse, uh, it's a very diverse area for spiders in Colorado. And they uh, are in, include many, many, many different families and also probably include several different under, yet to be described species. So 600 spiders and how many of those are tarantulas? We have, uh, well, one species of, uh, well, that's a hard question. We have one big hairy tarantula, <laughs> which is a Fonopelma hensi. But then on the Western slope, we have at least one species of burrowing mygalomorph, tarantula-like spider that is in a genus called Eumidia. Um, and it's, we, we may even have two different species of that trapdoor spider in the western part of the state. Oh, because I had heard of Texas brown and then the Oklahoma, but now I wonder if people are simply using Oklahoma and Texas interchangeably for the same spider. Well, they're not, they're not, they haven't caught up with the taxonomic uh, scientific literature is what's going on. So uh, well, probably about eight years ago now, some colleagues who are tarantula experts published um, uh, what we call a monograph, which is a revision of the genus of fauna pelma. That's the genus that my, my boy belongs to, in which they synonymize. We thought that we had five or six or seven different species. And in that paper, they realized using DNA and morphology that no, we really just have one in Colorado. But it used to be that we thought we had several different ones. Whoa, thank you so much. That was sure. a helpful answer. You're welcome. Thanks very much. <laughs>